We are all in this longevity community together. And you and I both understand the importance of reducing our body's aging and even reversing aging because this is the key to almost everything and anything in health. This is going to achieve us all of the benefits, including better skin, uh, protection from diseases, lower body fat, lower belly fat. So this is what we need to achieve. However, there is so much controversy in this realm and especially conflicting studies about supplements that we take. One of these supplements is resveratrol. Dr. Brad Stanfield published a video called Why I Stopped Taking Resveratrol. And he mentioned there a few studies and papers that disprove the value of resveratrol. Personally, I really appreciate Brad Stanfield and I think his channel is excellent. Dr. Sinclair, however, has been researching and endorsing resveratrol his entire life. And on his Twitter account, Sinclair commented on Stanfield's video describing it as what would seem like horse shit. On its face value, there is no reason to go against Sinclair's take on resveratrol. And this guy has been studying resveratrol for over two decades. But you're smart and this is not enough for you. What is more confusing here that the studies and papers that Stanfield uh, showed and mentioned in his video, they really seem legit. This study shows that resveratrol hurts exercise benefits. This paper claiming certain activity, the target of resveratrol, may not affect aging at all. And this study with CRISPR technology, supposedly the best of the best technology that we, we have right now, shows that resveratrol doesn't activate sirtuins. So it's all seem very confusing. Is David Sinclair wrong? If you're taking resveratrol, are you making a mistake? Are you aging like the rest of the population, despite all your efforts to reverse that process? What's the truth? The truth lies in data interpretation. Interpretation of data means everything, much more than data. Data can take you only so far, but the interpretation of data, what happens in the thinking mind, in our brains, that's what matters, how we interpret the data. Otherwise, we make very uh, erroneous conclusions. For example, you reach conclusions such as playing basketball make you taller. So today I'm going to do some data interpretation to these studies and hopefully remove some of the confusion that you may have. Let me remind you that there is no certification of youth on youthfulness preservation. You cannot learn the, this stuff in the academy. You have to read yourself, think, experiment, see your results, and possibly following experts who have experience with lab animals like Sinclair. If that's fair enough to you, now we can begin. Let's start. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Riman. Okay, to understand the conflict of research, we have to understand resveratrol. Resveratrol does two main things. It has two functions. The first one, it supposedly activates sirtuins, especially SIRT1, which is one of the sirtuins out of the seven. Another activity of resveratrol is it's an antioxidant. In the past, people used to make the mistake uh, thinking that this is why it reverses aging. This is not why it reverses aging. In fact, it could be the key to many of the conflict of studies about resveratrol. When I worked on resveratrol as a longevity molecule, first we showed it in yeast and worms and flies and mice. Uh, before that, it was thought that resveratrol was good for your heart in red wine when you drink red wine because it's an antioxidant. So then we showed that it extended the lifespan of yeast cells through this um, genetic pathway, the sirtuins. And we then tested whether resveratrol, if we changed one atom to make it not an antioxidant, guess what, it still worked fine. So it wasn't its antioxidant activity that was extending lifespan, it was its ability to turn on the yeast's defenses against aging. Conversely, when we gave the yeast antioxidants, they lived shorter. So yeah, that was the beginning of my mm -hmm. transformation into thinking, turn on the body's defenses, don't give it the antioxidant. Now here's the thing, your body has an antioxidant system. However, your body and the DNA is pretty lazy. If you take antioxidants from the outside, but your antioxidant system works perfectly, then it's going to respond by reducing its antioxidant defense. This is why there are studies showing that antioxidants for healthy young people reduce longevity. But if you do that with old people, suddenly you get a reversal of the impact. In essence, antioxidants 
external antioxidants as opposed to antioxidants produced by your body, they make uh, your body lazy. Now, what happens when you do exercise? Especially when you do cardiovascular exercise, you inhale a massive amount of oxygen. This is in essence a stress, a toxin that put on your, on your body. To be more scientifically correct here, the oxidative stress of exercise is mainly coming from the lack of oxygen. I guess oversimplified something that is completely unintuitive. So when you engage in an exercise where there is high demand for oxygen, uh, then it leads to oxidative stress and free radicals. So it's not really the oxygen that is the toxin as much as the oxidative stress that arising from activity that demands a lot of oxygen. And as a result of this oxygen stress that you put on your body, let's say 20 minutes every week, then you get a higher protection from oxygen for the rest of the week. However, what happens when you take resveratrol and you have resveratrol in your blood when you're exercising? In this situation, I would assume it's going to minimize a lot of the benefits of resveratrol. I'm going to explain what to do in a minute, but let's go over the studies and analyze them. So this study says that all subjects perform eight weeks of high intensity interval training, cycling twice a week. In addition, subjects conducted a timed five kilometers walk once a week. So as you can see, this is a cardiovascular activity. You get a large amount of oxygen in a short amount of time. You don't want resveratrol in the blood when you do those activities. Let's see what happens in the second study. High intensity interval spinning training twice per week, in addition to five kilometers walk once per week. Again, we see it's a cardiovascular activity and the results show that resveratrol negates some of the benefits of exercise. This is not surprising. If you're healthy, young, and you're exercising, you don't want a resveratrol in your blood. So what you want to do is really cycle resveratrol. So to me, that makes sense. So what I do personally, I take resveratrol once every two days. I don't want my antioxidant defense system to get used to this antioxidant. I want this, I want my inner natural innate antioxidant system to work as hard as possible without any additional influence from the outside that's going to make my body lazy. In addition, I don't take resveratrol before exercise. I take it after exercise. I think it stays in the body for about 24, maybe a bit more hours. So you've got the time to cycle resveratrol. And if you need more corroboration for that, Sinclair himself said that if they take healthy mouse, then uh, they get the maximum amount of benefit when they cycle resveratrol one day on, one day off. And this is a clip where you can listen to him saying that himself. If we gave it to mice their whole lifespan, they were protected against a high-fat diet, which we call the Western diet. They had lean organs. They lived slightly longer, but not a lot. This is what's not known, though it's in the supplemental data of the paper that nobody ever reads. The mice that were given resveratrol every second day on a normal diet lived dramatically longer than any other group. So people out there, you know, my, my critics say, oh, resveratrol didn't extend the lifespan of mice on a normal diet, therefore, it's not aging, it's just protecting against a high fat diet. Well, look at the supplemental data, please. If you give it to, to the mice every other day, we had mice living over three years. And what that told me is that probably you don't wanna be taking a supplement every day. You can take it either every other day or give your body a rest. ask why there are studies on animals that show that resveratrol improves cardiovascular activity and physical activity. First of all, some of these studies, they use resistance training. So it could have been, I'm not sure, that resistance training is less sensitive to antioxidants because the main stress from resistance training is not necessarily the amount of oxygen that we breathe. The second possible reason for contradiction on exercise with resveratrol between mice, for example, and humans, could be the sensitivity of our bodies for antioxidants. You see, we are human beings and we are amongst the only mammals that do not make vitamin C. And it could be, and I, I know from my research that our antioxidant uh, system has to be stronger because of that. 
So we only need about 20 milligrams of vitamin C per day, as opposed to animals who can produce grams of vitamin C every day. So are much more dependent on this production of vitamin C. So it could be that us humans, because of our powerful antioxidant system that is not dependent on vitamin C, is more sensitive to taking antioxidants from the outside. There is additional problem with the studies that's showing that a resveratrol blunts the benefits of exercise. It has to do with the absorption of resveratrol. It's not clear to me whether it was taken with fat as it should or with water. I'm quoting from both of these studies. The first one, all participants were instructed to take one tablet each morning. The second one uh, is the subject received tablets every two weeks and were instructed to take their daily tablet at the time every morning. When I tell my clients to take tablet every morning, usually they take it with water because most people are not very hungry as they wake up. So to me, it's not clear whether it was taken properly. Nevertheless, I would not expect resveratrol before exercise and chronically for healthy people as opposed to old people to be any benefit because of the antioxidant effect that I explained. Now let's go to another study that Brad Stanfield showed. So in this paper, they reviewed studies that knock out the gene for sirtuin. And they showed that nevertheless, the caloric restriction achieved lifespan benefits. So this is what they concluded. The role of sirtuins in lifespan extension by caloric restriction has been challenged. See what they're saying. They're not saying that the role of sirtuins in lifespan extension at all has been challenged. They only said it has been challenged by the impact of the caloric restriction. And this is not very surprising to me because anybody who's been following the research know that the main uh, mechanism, a different mechanism that caused caloric restriction to increase lifespan has to do with TOR, the target of rapamycin. We know that this doesn't take anything from the impact and activation of the sirtuins in a way that preserve our youthfulness. It's just a separate mechanism. And we, I know that there are four genetic mechanisms that control aging within the cell and additional eight mechanisms outside of the cell. So we want to ac activate all of them. And if one is responsible for a certain result, it doesn't take anything or negate any benefit from the other mechanisms. And I can tell you, my passion is youthfulness preservation. And I've been researching this area for over 15 years now. And every time the DNA wants to make your body younger, it activates the sirtuins. So to me, it's very clear that sirtuins is absolute no-brainer, one of the mechanisms together with NAD that controls aging in the body. Now let's go to another study that Brad Stanfield showed. I'm quoting, the ability of resveratrol to inhibit cell proliferation and S phase transit was independent of the histone deacylitase sirtuin 1. This study with CRISPR technology, supposedly the best of the best technology that we, we have right now, shows that resveratrol doesn't activate sirtuins. But let's go deeper into the study. Let's see how they conducted the study. We conducted the CRISP genome-wide screen in NALM6 cells. What are NALM6 cells? NALM6 is a B-cell precursor to leukemia. In essence, we're talking about cancer cell from the immune system. But they did the study in another cell. Let's see what it is. We perform an additional genome-wide screen in the t all jerked cell line. What does t jerked cell line is? It's a human T cell leukemia, again, a cancer cell from the immune system. So what they did in the study, they used the CRISP technology and they work on cancerous white blood cells, immune cells. Now I have two problems with that. The first one is cancer has a different uh, genetic expression from a healthy body. In fact, when you look at cancer, it kind of revert back to the old amoeba-like cell. And to conclude that the genetic expression of cancer cell is a very good model for a healthy cell, to me is a pretty long distance to go. The DNA expression of cancer cell is significantly different. And the whole idea of CERT1 is genetic expression. The second problem for me is the type of uh, tissue. You see, different supplements, they target different tissues in the body. Not every supplement affects all the uh, tissues in the body. And we know that resveratrol activates very strongly the muscles, the liver, and possibly even the brain tissue. For my research, I haven't gotten the impression necessarily that resveratrol targets the immune system. 
So that could be additional explanation. It could be that resveratrol target different tissue and different types of cells uh, and affect their CERT1 and CERT2 inactivity and not so much in the immune system cells. So overall, as you can see, I don't really like the conclusions of this uh, study. And you have to remember that the data on resveratrol is massive. If you go after the bad studies, you also must explain the positive studies as well. And to me, I think that you also must integrate together with doing metabolic research and reading the studies also to see what happens in real life. And I think that Sinclair has such a huge amount of experience, live experience that you could see in the lab that I could never argue with what he has seen. So I trust his take together with my personal metabolic uh, research, which again supports the idea that resveratrol preserve youthfulness and reduce aging. So let me give you the bottom line and what I do with resveratrol. And resveratrol taking correctly is a wonderful anti-aging usefulness preservation supplement. Now, what do I do? Personally, I take about one gram every other day, always, always with fat, never before exercise, always after exercise. And sometimes I take it with a sip of alcohol, which possibly can improve the absorption as well of resveratrol. The thing is, I don't want resveratrol in my blood and in my muscles when I exercise because I want the stress from the oxygen. I don't want anything to negate that stress. So that's it. I invite you to watch my intro video where I show live results I achieved with clients, including some of them uh, reversing aging. And of course, I invite you to share and subscribe. It's gonna give you more motivation to produce videos about how to slow down aging or to preserve youthfulness, which is my passion in the last 15 years. Thank you and check the link in the description.